Welcome everyone to the third episode of the Dragon Cast. We we did it. <laughs> okay, so for those who are wondering, uh, you know, where's episode two? Well, it's on Gabby's channel. Hello. If you were paying attention last time, yes, yes, Gabby is here. Obviously, I am actually here. Yeah. Um. If you're yeah. So if you're wondering where that other episode is, it's on her channel. Because we said that last time, and you weren't paying attention. Go go watch it. It doesn't have enough views, so go check that out, and then you can come back to this one, and then you can listen to this one, and you'll know exactly where we're at. Shameless plugs are over, so let's go. <laughs> shameless plugs never end. This this entire project is an eternal shameless plug. It pretty much is. Yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's like Pokemon Red and Blue. It's like you gotta have both. If, if, if you want to get all 150, you, you got it. You got to just. You have to subscribe to both. That is actually a very good analogy. Yes, we we are we are shameless about this. So yeah, uh, we watched uh, this time around episodes nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. Um, so episode nine, um, like what, what I like to refer to as the filler episode. That's not actually filler. <laughs> Basically, because, I mean, in fact, I was thinking about this later on when I was looking at other parts and actual, like, filler parts of later episodes, but, yeah, like, I think the one thing that also, like, like, makes you think that it's, like, a filler episode is when, essentially, like, something happens and you kind of leave off, you end off exactly the same way as how you started, and in this case, it's kind of the same thing. In this episode, the gang are going off to find the last Dragon Ball. In the meantime, they stop up at some random village basically, to get gas, and then they end up fighting a guy, and after that, they leave the village, and they go back, and they end up fighting, going to find the last Dragon Ball. So, it does, like, it, it is literally a thing where you can kind of almost skip the story, because nothing really happens, like, nothing really relevant ha happens, except for the fact that Bulma changes her clothes, and, um... That's it. Yamcha and Puar, Yam and Yamcha and Puar actually help the heroes at one point. That's like I think it's like the first time they actually like legitimately go off to help them. Yeah, and the thing is though, it's not even like that's really that relevant because they're gonna pretty much do the exact same thing once Pilaf rolls around. So even that's kind of ends up being redundant. Yeah. So the entire point of this episode is Bulma gets a new outfit. That is the in and, and the thing is though, she needs a new outfit because she's stuck with this stupid bunny bullshit that wasn't even funny. Um, you know, when they did it in, in the original episode, like, you know, like when she got that episode, like when she got that outfit, it wasn't funny. It wasn't like a good joke or anything. It was just, ah, she's in a bunny outfit now. I guess that's sexy or funny. I don't know. I don't know what they were going for there. And it's kind of also weird because like, at that point, just judging by the way Toriyama's doing this stuff, you know, you'd kind of think that, oh, then maybe there's obviously... There's some kind of reason as to why she's in a bunny outfit besides like fan service, and there there kind of is this episode, but it's it, it it ends really with no proper conclusion. It's just like a fun moment they put in where basically because Bomber is dressed like a bunny, everyone is kind of terrified of her because um she is dressed like a bunny and she doesn't really know why. And then when they um when eventually she does change her outfit and stuff, it's like the moment she stops looking like a bunny, they're not scared of her anymore. And so it's sort of like, oh, oh. It's obviously some kind of, like, almost like, it's a foreshadowing to the fact that these bad guys are dressed like rabbits and the main boss is also a rabbit. But it's like, yeah, if, if that's supposed to be a joke, I don't really find it that funny, to be honest. Yeah, no, I, I, I would say this whole episode just feels like a waste. Um, like, yeah, it feels like a filler episode, and it doesn't even feel like a good filler episode. It's not even like, like, oh, like, they did, like, some really crazy creative things this episode. No, it's just, they go to a village, uh, or they go to a town, Bulma gets a new outfit, everyone's scared of her because of the bunny thing, and then we get introduced to the characterizer bunny and his gang and that is that is it oh actually i've got to like okay this is one of those things where it's like i feel like i need to stop and talk about okay what is this guy's name i, I swear i feel like i've seen like like four different names for him okay so it's like in in this in the subs like it will yeah in the subs at one point they call him usagi ninjika nin nin ninjika mm -hmm. ak which is sort of like i think it's roughly translated to like the bunny with who can turn people into carrots but I swear, I've also heard him be called, okay, is it like Boss Rabbit and Monster Carrots? Like, where do these names even come from? Okay, so Boss Rabbit 
is okay so there are a few different yeah because i had that same issue because okay in the dub i believe he's referred to as monster carrot that is his name in the dub and the title was the title of that episode said something about boss rabbit oh okay and i think like like, and i think i think like even his henchmen referred to him as boss rabbit uh but yeah like like he you know his, his name is monster carrot i believe and then the, the name that I just referred to him to as is the Caratizer Bunny is actually something that I stole from one of Lance's Dragon Ball Die sections. Okay, I'm like, I'm like, I do remember Lance saying that, and I didn't know if that was, like, official name or... Yeah. So what, is that, like, a Bloomer thing where he just coined that term or something? I don't, I don't know. Lance, Lance uh, Lance if, 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 if you're this. watching this one, <laughs> like, let me know where you got that from, because I've been meaning to ask you about that, because I don't know where he got that from. I thought it was, but I thought it was a really creative way. This is how we use our podcast. We just go and shout out and talk to our friends and ask them for things. Right. You know, people who we could just easily just call on Skype. No, we have to do this via YouTube videos and podcasts. But yeah, um... It, but like I always thought that was a really creative way of going about uh, adapting his name because trying to say his name like, like all that ja- like Usagi Ninkenjen I think you said I, I don't I don't even and remember I, I I my on my notes I've written Usagi Ninjika but I don't Ninjika, know Ninjika okay Ninjika I don't know if that's maybe so that's it. yeah like you know, that's that I feel is like 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 that's really difficult to say <laughs> personally yeah. and. His, uh, and I don't want to use any of his dub names, and just calling him Rabbit that turns people, because that's a, that's a description. Yeah. That's not really, like, you know, it's kind of weird to do that. So, uh, when I heard Lance call him the Caratizer Bunny, I'm like, that's brilliant, because that, that very much gets across of what his name means. You know, he turns people into carrots, Caratizer, and it's a pun on Energizer Bunny. Oh! So, I'm like, I that's... I didn't notice that either. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. When Lance, the first time I ever heard Lance say that, I was just like, "Oh my god, that's brilliant!" Because it both it both adapts what his name means. Uh, it makes it, you know, not sound really stupid and awkward in English, and it's a pun on Energizer Bunny on top of it. I'm like, that is the most brilliant adaptation I've ever heard of that name. I don't know where he got it from. If he came up for, if he came up with it himself, that is brilliant, sir. Uh, if not, whoever came up with that. Uh, that name, that way of saying his name, is brilliant. Because I'm just looking at the manga yeah. now, and this calls him the Carrot Master, so that's another name for him. Another name for him. <laughs> but yeah, so this episode, like I said, it's... Oh god, I don't I don't really have too much to say about this, because like I said, it's, it's a complete fluff filler episode thing that's just not filler. Like, the, like the, the one thing of note about it is the fact that it's not a filler episode. Uh, it's, it's actually stuff in the manga... Uh, the few points I have about this is, uh, first off, Bulma, I, I've realized something going back through this, and it's something that I've noticed before, and I've kind of, like, double-checking on, because, you know, I, I brought up, uh, you know, characters in Dragon Ball, like, you know, he, they, they still kind of have that Dr. Slump proportions, where they're all kind of very stout and short and whatnot, mm-hmm. and uh, I think this is a really good episode that, that depicts that, because Bulma and Yamcha are, like, built like normal people. You go to this village... Everyone's shorter than Bulma. All the men come up to, like, Bulma's shoulders. I didn't think about that. And and the same thing goes for uh, the village that Oolong ter- terrorized. Like, like the shaman, you know, his, uh, like, you know, like the chief shaman, like, he's, like, you know, up to Bulma's shoulders as well. Everyone is, like, really, really short in this series, except for my Bulma and Yamcha. And it's really weird because, I mean, this will eventually change later on when we get, you know, taller characters and stuff. But right now, like, you know, everyone is just super Dr. Slump proportioned. And then you have these three normal proportioned characters. And I've always thought it was really weird. Um, It's not something that's going to carry over for much longer. I'm pretty sure by the end of this tournament that stops being a thing. But yeah, it's just really weird now seeing it. Yeah, um, actually speaking of Bulma, one thing I also noticed about this episode, uh, I don't know if this is necessarily like actually like, it was something with Bulma and it almost felt like almost like kind of character development for her in that like, you know, in, in this episode, the members of the rabbit gang, they kind of like see, see Bulma and like, oh, look at the hot girl. Hey, why don't you go and hang out with us? And Bulma basically immediately turns them down. And I actually found that kind of strange because it was like, I mean, before, Bulma tended to kind of basically fold to any guy who would 
have her at all, including like people who that everyone had told them that they had tried to kill them, including people like Yamcha and Oolong when he had turned into a into a guy. So it's like, but for some reason the Rabbit Gang, Bulma actually doesn't really want to care them around them at all, and she's immediately like, no, these are bad guys. Goku, you deal with the bad guys. And I don't know if this is like character development or there's like something different with her or like there's something different about them. I. I think that you're giving her character way too much credit because I just immediately wrote that off as, well, they're not attractive. Oh. I mean, it, That's it, it. could be, to be fair, it yeah. could be that. Yeah, because... Don't they, like, wear, like... Because, because, you know... What do they even look like? I mean, I mean, they're, they're wearing, like, the helmets and, like, yeah, the so goggles like and really... stuff. But, I mean, you can still tell... You, 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 you can see that, like, one of them is, like, this short, pudgy fucker, and then the other one is this guy with, like, bony cheeks and, like, you know, like, like, kind of, like, a crooked nose, and, you know, you, you can you can see at least, you know, from that much, and until she has, like, any kind of reason to think that they're handsome, she has no reason to care. Because, like, she didn't care about Oolong until she saw, oh, Oolong's all handsome now. And... Then, uh, like, you know, like the whole thing with Yamcha. You know, Yamcha's a bad guy. He's a literal bandit, and she's, like, all googly-eyed over him because he's young and sexy, and he's, like, this roguish bandit type. You know, like, these guys are just, like, a bunch of pudgy thugs wearing bunny ears. They're not sexy. That is, like, to me, I just, I just view Bulma as a typical shallow teenage girl who wants, like, a boy band idol-looking guy and not some pudgy thug. I was gonna say, though, it, it is nice seeing Bulma actually, like, act like she legitimately does kind of care a bit or acting like she is sort of a, a, at least a somewhat decent person where she's like, hey, look, Goku, these are bad guys. Go beat them up for, for us. And, like, I mean, okay, that's not really, like, such a very nice thing to do, but it's, like, at the very least, like, it, it, it's not like she's getting everyone into trouble again by being really annoying and whatever. The thing is, though, is she doing that because, like, oh, these are bad people, or is she doing it because these are bad people who are bothering me? Like, like you know, because, you know, they may not have actually, like, I mean, if they were just, like, say, a couple of dudes who were just like, hey, baby, want to have a good time? And she's like, no, it's like, oh, come on, sweet cheeks. <laughs> and then, you know, would she still have, like, hey, my super strong 12-year-old friend, go beat the ever-loving shit out of these guys. You know, or would she have just been like, go away? You know, like, you know, because I don't think, I really don't think that their, like, moral alignment has anything to do with her sicking Goku on. I just think it's just, I'm not attracted to these losers, and they're harassing me. Goku, go commit acts of violence against them. She goes and sticks her attack 12 year old on her, on them. That, that, to be honest, that makes more sense, but I, I, I am kind of, I, I do wonder, because, like, they do, like, they do kind of go out of their way, sort of show that the rabid gang are like pretty despicable guys but i don't know you know what character interpretation it's it's up to interpretation See, there you go it's what you think yeah it's what you think. also um so something that isn't up for interpretation uh this this is a, a sticking point for me um and i think it's something that we need to address because if not we're gonna hear about it goku survives yeah. the vacuum of space and oh, we no. know, no. we know that no. science can't survive no. space. No. This is like one, like this is one of the worst <laughs> plot holes in the entire series. No. Like, I mean, he rides in Yoibo all the way up to space, survives in that lack of atmosphere, and I am just disgusted by Toriyama just, you know, disrespecting his own series to this degree. It is horrible. How could he? <laughs> <laughs> I, I I think we we said all that needs to be said on that subject. Yay! <laughs> but yeah, so I, tell you. Yeah, so something I do want to bring up though about the space thing though is just it's really weird that ending gag. Like I get that the ending gag is like based off of like a children's fairy tale or like whatever, like children's story. It's not even like a fairy tale. It's just like a. It's just like that's like a thing. It's like the. It's like that's like a thing where it's like they you, you tell kids or like everyone sort of like knows like this big cultural thing where it's like oh no there's a, like you know it, look it's, it's a on the moon it's a rabbit that's pounding rice cakes like get it so it's like it, it's not even like a story it's just like everyone kind of I, I assume everyone kind of knows that kind of thing yeah and it's like I'm trying to think of an equivalent but I don't also because I don't actually know what the equivalent is right yeah I don't think we really have one it's just. It's just like something like uh, some, some weird bullshit thing we tell kids. Like babies come from storks. It's just whatever. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Like that's probably a good idea. So yeah, it, it, that that's like probably a rough equivalent. So it's like yeah, when Goku does it, it's like 
Oh yeah, like like the moment you see them, and because like also remember, there's also there's also actual rabbits on the moon there with them. So you know, it's like obviously it's something there. It's it is obviously a bit weird though. Yeah, it's and yeah, it's just it's, that, that, that he, they decide to just like put in a kind of like cultural reference there, and that's kind of like the end. Like it's obviously it's not a gag. But it's just like at the end, it's the climax, and it's. It's a weird climax. It's not really doesn't really feel like anything. But I'm pretty sure that goes for this entire episode. Like this episode really felt like nothing. I will say though, it's a nice looking episode, and I looked it up, and Maeda, Maeda's team worked on this one again, again. Jeez. Yeah. How good uh, can this guy correct drawings? I don't even know. Right. Like yeah, the the mere fact that this guy Wait. has like you know he 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 has his hands in so many episodes early on is pretty nuts. One, two. Like, did you put him on this episode? I mean, this was—it looked great. It's a good-looking episode. Um, but man, what a waste to put him on! Like, yeah, where the fuck was like Uchiyama or Ibisawa? I don't know. I mean, next <laughs> actually no, because the next few episodes all look pretty good. I'm not even really sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Honestly, I have like some things to say about the, the, some of the later yeah, episodes um, and its animation. But yeah. yeah. In, in fact, even like the, the the kind of Toriyama twist of this episode. It, it just feel like it just really doesn't feel like as well constructed as everything else. Where it's like, so like, what was the twist this episode? What was the thing that was new? Like, yeah, I don't think the, there the, was the a twist. The twist is kind of like the the boss, the big intimidating boss is just a rabbit. Is the rabbit supposed to be unintimidating? Yeah. But like, you know, we've seen animal people around. I mean, I guess there was that bear with the sword, and then Goku beat the bear with the sword easily. But he was still a bear with a sword, so. Is is it just like you don't expect a rabbit to be a mob boss? And it, it's the joke that like. That Goku, um, is, is it the joke that the rabbit turns people into carrots? Is, is that supposed to be, like, really weird and shocking? Like, it, does, does everyone have, like, you know, how many people have the ability to turn people into carrots? Like, why does he have the ability to turn people yeah. into carrots? Like, like, what has that got to do with anything? Like, it, it's, is it like yeah. a martial arts technique? Do you learn how to, do you learn how to turn people into carrots? Is it, is it magic? Is it yeah. part of his biology? Has it got something to do with like Majin Buu's candy beam? I don't know, but it, it is just so odd. And like, obviously there are things in Dragon Ball that are odd, but this one is especially odd. Yeah, I would say like this, th this whole thing like brings up two things for me. Uh, one, you know, yeah, what, what the hell is the point of this character? And two... Man, this character be re be really useful in the tournament of power. <laughs> just, 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 just grab him by the back of his shirt and just run him through a crowd of people as he touches all of them. Just sh shove a bunch, like shove like eighty-seven carrots off the edge of the ring. Yeah, because this is one, of, and this is one of those things where it doesn't, feel, where it isn't like you know, oh, this is a technique, but if you're strong enough, you can avoid it. Like, it, I mean, to be fair, they, he didn't ever end up trying to do it to Goku, but like the assumption is he can do it to anyone without fail. So it's like. This episode's really weird. This 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 storyline is really weird, and it's probably why people. I, I mean, do people actually? I wonder if people legitimately thought it was filler until they watched this. Guys, if 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 you in the podcast, if you thought this episode was filler until this time, tell me in the video description because I'm actually curious. Yeah. Okay, so we get past that. You know, this <laughs> there's this weird kind of not all that interesting, not all that creative episode. I, I would say this is definitely like like one of the low points, and I feel like this kind of that's precedent for a few low points going forward in this arc for me. But uh, we, we, we then start getting into the actual peel-off stuff, the, the finale uh, of this arc, which is kind of weird. Like, you know, the series, like, like, I wonder if Toriyama originally meant for this arc to be so short, because it's pretty damn short. Like, they, they didn't even have enough content to really properly fill out 13 episodes. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, but, uh, considering that we already start with, like, three Dragon Balls, I mean, obviously, maybe he did think it was going to be short, but then again, like, he didn't really have any plans as to what he was going to do after that until, like, those last episodes with the Muten Roshi stuff and the martial arts stuff. So, I don't even know. I don't know what Toriyama was thinking in these early episodes. I mean, I've got to admit, it's, it's kind of odd, but, yeah. Yeah, so... In the manga, this would have been originally our introduction to Mai Shu and Pilaf. Yep. Yeah, you know, which all begins with you know uh, Mai seeing them, you know, coming on the car, and you see like radios Pilaf, and or I think she radios Shu, and then they go back to Pilaf's, uh, you know, castle. And really, all this episode is mostly just um, like. I would say it's mostly, you know, just kind of set up. It's set up and filler is what the majority of this episode is taken up with. Yep. Getting, you know, I feel like because 
peel off my shoe have been introduced in filler. There isn't a whole lot to say about them this arc. Um, I do like when Goku like goes after the shoe bot and like finds like that empty mech and he like pokes it and he's just like, oh, it's oh what a weakling and he kinda does like a little Buddhist thing. Oh yeah, that was great, yep. Like that was that was a great little thing. Uh I, I love one one of my uh favorite lines from the original dub uh, of this was uh, when Goku taps him with his staff and he goes, ah, he's dead. Ah, rigor mortis. When he taps him and he doesn't move. I was just like, because <laughs> my immediate reaction to that was, why why does this little 12-year-old jungle boy know what rigor mortis is? He doesn't know because what a girl dumb. is. Right? It was one of those things where, I mean, I always knew that was a dub line. It had to be something that was included only in the dub. But it was a line that was both funny, and then made me go, wait, what? <laughs> so yeah, there's that. Um, I'll say this episode looks really great. Um, there's there's a lot of, you know, like, slick pieces of animation in this episode. Everything looks really on model, really tight. Um, and also, th- as far as I know, this is the first episode that uh, Shida worked on. Wait, would he really? Because he was on Uchi... Because he, under- he was on the Uchiyama, right? And we saw it, there, there's been an... Wait, is this the first? Is this the first Uchiyama episode? Sorry, it took me a while to get my thoughts together. Uh, this isn't the first Uchiyama episode, but this is the first one where uh, he's credited as an animator. I think he's. Oh, I think okay. he, Yeah, yeah, he's actually credited as a, as an in betweener. Okay. So he's not even like a key animator. Oh, but that's so like, it's actually so crazy though because like nowadays Shira is basically known as like that guy at Toei who does all the really cool shit, and it's like he basically started off with Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm. And it's like you know, I, we kind of wanted to go become. We kind of wanted to be in Dragon Ball because, like, he he did Dragon Ball. He did a lot in Dragon Ball. We don't. We didn't really realize it as much because his style isn't as distinctive. But he he did so much for Dragon Ball, especially later on. So yeah, and it's just wild to think like you're, you're seeing him like you know we're ten episodes in the Dragon Ball and here's Sita, the God King of Animation of Super, and he's the in betweener of all things. Oh no, it's it is, it is really interesting, but. I've got to say, you know, this is one of those times where I'm going to say, you know what, anime, I am going to give you a bone here. You, you did definitely fix something in that, in the manga, we don't get any of that pilaf stuff in, like, the earlier episodes in, in Dragon Ball. Like, this is the first introduction we get to pilaf, and it just raises the question, who the hell are these guys? Right? And how do they know so much? Yeah, like, like, because I was going back and checking out the manga when I got to this part, and because I know that there's like a lot of stuff added into this, and I was thinking about just how abruptly they're introduced in the manga, and just like, like, like I know that you don't care for the filler that much, but I really feel like it really does like give us some kind of context for these characters because you know it's not just like they come out of nowhere it's just like oh like they're doing their own thing and now they're kind of intersecting with our heroes but our heroes haven't noticed yet and now they've made their big reveal to our heroes in episode 10 as far as the anime is concerned in the manga it's just they just show up they're just there yeah they they they, not only do they just show up but like they they kind of imply they sort of knew that these characters were coming they know exactly how to deal with them they know exactly how they get the dragon balls and like you know like and like you know they have basically traps waiting for these guys and just like it it does feel like these characters were waiting for goku and ko to show up but they never met goku and ko they don't know who these guys are and it's like who, who is this guy? Who is Pilaf? And I'm I, and I'm I'm going to keep asking this question in the next few episodes. Yeah, and yeah, like, and it's really weird to think that like the Pilaf gang have become this kind of repetitive thing. It's like even in Dragon Ball, like you know they're going to come back at the end of the Red Ribbon Army arc. They're going to come back uh, for the Piccolo Daimao arc. So it's really weird that they're going to be these characters who resurface. Where like in in the manga proper, like they're not like. They're not really anything. They're just kind of like these random villains that they bumped into at the end of a storyline, at the end of their first adventure. And at least in the anime, like, it kind of builds them up as kind of, you know, these kind of goofball, uh, you know, characters who have been watching Goku and company that are aware that they're capturing the Dragon Balls that they all, and that they're also trying to collect the Dragon Balls as well. So yeah, like I feel like as far as the anime goes, it like the filler and stuff like treats Pilaf a lot better because 
you know, we get context into his character, Mai and Shu. You know, we it still leaves us with a lot of questions, like specifically, who the hell are these people? Why does Pilaf have all these resources and whatnot? But at very least, you know, we do have, you know, context, you know, some context for them, their personalities, and what their mission statement is within the series. Yeah, basically. Although I've got to say, that, um, one other good thing about this episode, you know, this episode finally, like, the gang actually all comes together. Everyone is all together. Yamcha and Puar do kind of hesitate and be like, okay, fine. I mean, if they're going to get the Dragon Balls, we still need to follow them to get the Dragon Balls and they need our help or else they're not going to get them. So let's go and do that. And then they do that. And then it's, you know, Yamcha and Puar are part of the gang. Now all five of them are together. Right, five? Yeah, five of them? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, now, now, now we got like our full Sentai team of Dragon Ball characters. We got everyone together. Yeah, you know, I'm just wondering if they. I'm just wondering if they're like a five man band. But like, I don't even know what Puar would count as. Is he even a character? Well, well, he's that 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 punk bitch who just kind of shakes the tambourine. Yeah, I don't know what that is. He the no, but like I'm like, is he the chick? But I'm like, no, the bomber is the chick. That sorry, I'm talking in TV tropes. Um, never mind. <laughs> well, see, no, like in the five man team dynamic, he would be like 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 the like like the like the worthless little kid character who's just there. So like Gohan, if Gohan didn't do shit, basically, like like if, if Gohan were just completely worthless and didn't sack up, he'd be Poir. <laughs> I really don't like Poir. He's just so lame. He doesn't he doesn't add anything. <sighs> he has no character. Like I don't even care that he's like because like I I think like you know he could be interesting. I, I like him. I like the idea of Yamcha having a foil to you know kind of bounce dialogue off of. I like um. I like uh, what was it? Oh crap! Uh, I'm blanking. I, I yeah, I just like you know him having you know like him being there for Yamcha for someone the Yamcha to, to bounce off of. But like, just give him a personality for fuck's sake. Not just have him be like you know I don't know talk shit about Oolong and just kind of suck Yamcha's dick. That's it. That's that, that is that is the purpose of his character, yeah. and it just kind of makes him really boring. It does. Another thing that's also kind of fun to do is fun to see is like. You know, when they're actually in the castle, and, I mean, this is Pillar as well, but, like, you know, like, you know, they kind of, they're going in this castle, and they don't really know what they're doing, and then there's suddenly Pillars that are showing up, and they're, like, you know, Yamcha and Goku in their own ways are trying to deal with this and try to do their martial arts actions to get them out of it, and it's like, oh, hey, like, this is fun, like, actual kind of Dragon Ball Kung Fu action. Like, I like this. This is kind of, this is fun, even if a lot of it's kind of disposable. Yeah. It, it, honestly, it's taken too long to get to some of this kind of stuff, so. Yeah, honestly, like, I, like, when they first get to the castle and they're avoiding traps and stuff, I really dug that part. Like, Yamcha gets, like, a legitimately cool moment where, like, Bulma gets picked up by, like, one of the stone pillars, and he, like, jumps, like, kicks and sp- Busted in pieces of one of the first times you're really gonna see, like, oh shit, Yamcha's like a legitimately competent martial artist. He is like a powerful dude, and that was really cool. He gets like his cool hero moment, and then you know, like you know, they they kind of follow up like a little bit of a gag where he almost gets hit, but he dodges at the last second, and uh, Goku breaks the pillar and drops it on him. Yeah, like that whole stuff I thought was really cool. But yeah, uh, after that, though, I feel like things really start kind of dragging. Uh, I will say, I do like how they're also kind of developing Yamcha, where you start seeing, like, he he's slowly getting over his fear of women. You know, like... Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, like, you know, he actually, you know, sucks it up and, like, gives them a ride, and Bulma gets in the car with him, and he's still, he's still red-faced, he's still, like, kind of freaking out a little bit, and he's just, you know, but... He's he's dealing with it better now, and so that's actually kind of cool that we're getting a character who had a problem at the beginning of the arc, and we're slowly seeing him just through his exposure to Bulma, you know, repeatedly now. Just he's getting a bit more used to it. He's getting a bit more comfortable, and he's you know, he he's getting over that fear, you know, that that kind of anxiety that he has, and that's really cool to see you know a character develop over the course of an arc. Is moral of the story to all you martial arts nerds out there. If you are afraid of women, just tag along with one for a while. You'll get used to it. And then you realize that women aren't that different after all. No, women are scary and evil and they're trying to ruin our video games. I know because anti-feminists on the internet said so, Gabby. Oh yeah, no, I'm incredibly scary. Yeah, yeah, look at her. Oh yeah, you can't look at her because it's an audio <laughs> podcast. But trust me, like, uh... she, she, she's like eight feet tall, breathes fire. She's secretly an Australian kaiju. 
Australia I also say, has I kaiju. Wish, I wish I, I wish I could secretly breathe fire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure you and most women wish they could. I'm pretty sure anyone would want to breathe fire, unless the fire actually burned them back. <laughs> like, as, as long as you have like a fire retardant mouth, I think anyone would want to breathe fire. How did we get to talking about this? Uh, I'm very easy to derail in conversations, and I like to make stupid jokes that have nothing to do with what the hell I'm talking about. Right, right, that's it. Everything makes sense now. Uh, have, have, have you seen Have you seen the videos I do with Agro on Super? Like, like half of that is us critiquing Dragon Ball. The other is the other half is us just making the dumbest jokes possible. Uh, speaking of dumb jokes, episode eleven. Hmm. Episode yes. 11 does... They okay, took out... No, Alright, I want to explain this because I, I realize, in fact, it, there's, there's actually more to this than we initially thought. Episode 11 takes out two big jokes. Two big jokes from the start of, from the start of the manga. The first one is perhaps one of my favorite, even though it's kind of really dumb, dumb, just complete fourth wall breaks in the entire series. And, we'll, we'll, and they complete... Well, they, they have the beginning of it, but they don't have the real kind of punchline. Well, basically... Um, mm -hmm. Pilaf is asking, talking about how there's no, that there aren't any balls, and then Mai just comments, well, maybe there's one between their man's legs, and then everyone just kind of stops because it was a really terrible joke, and then Pilaf's just like, you know, we don't appreciate vulgar humor here, but then in the manga, after that, suddenly Mai is holding a poop on a stick, and then, and then Pilaf just suddenly realizes it's a Dr. Slump reference, and then he's just like, and he, he immediately starts breaking the fourth wall and starts talking about how some manga creators strive to make their work dignified and refined. And, you know, we can't just pander to audiences, like the audience of Dr. Slump, by making really bad, like, you know, really crude jokes and stuff. This is supposed to be much more dignified manga. So, it's... It's ridiculous. I am actually kind of surprised that the anime didn't put it in, because, like, they honestly still could have put it in, because, like... You'd assume that they would still kind of know, the anime, people watching the anime would still kind of know what Dr. Slump is, and in fact they were probably watching Dr. Slump before this, so it's like, I feel like the context is still the same, but maybe they wanted to stand it more on its own as opposed to it just being a Toriyama work. Well, see, that's the thing, though. Like, I feel like that doesn't that doesn't actually work, because they said that they wanted to stand more on its own, because there's another Dr. Slump reference much earlier. I forgot to mention this, but it's at, um... I think it's the episode where the Muten Roshi is introduced. Uh, when they or shit, whatever. One of the episodes. Oh yeah, the thing with the thing with the thing with the tor when when Tori bot the Tori bot just shows up and asks if it was Penguin Village. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So so and they kept that in, but they didn't get this in. That's so weird. Yeah. So so they 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 have like a Doctor Slump reference, and like 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 you point out, like you know, this series immediately followed Dragon Ball or uh, Doctor Slump. So, the last episode of Dr. Slump ends on a next episode preview, and it's the first episode of Dragon Ball being advertised. And then the very next week, Slump ends, and Dragon Ball picks up in its time slot. You know, like, you know, they, they, they both had, like, you know, like, it's just one Toriyama series into the next. Like, it, it, I'm sure, like, even the manga had a little bit of downtime to it, you know, where, where this didn't have any. It just transitioned like normal. And they just cut out, like, this really clever, great Dr. Slump. Well, not, okay, I guess it really isn't clever, but it's a really legitimately funny fourth wall break that is both a Dr. Slump reference and just, you know, like a really funny fourth wall break, and they just, they just removed it for no reason. I can't figure out why they would. It's, I mean, like I said, I, I, I think it just might be they basically want to take themselves a bit more seriously, but then they didn't know, I don't know, maybe somebody different wrote this episode, because they also skipped another joke where basically Yamcha just makes a really bad pun at one point, and then everyone just kind of stares at him, and they're like, why? And he's basically just like, I kind of want to lighten up the situation, pretty much. And it's it's weird, it's also one of those things, like, I, I, I think it's very Japanese, because, like, Viz tried to translate it, like by giving it doing an English pun instead, but um, and you, I, I don't actually know what it is in Japanese, but yeah, either way, Yamcha then makes a bad pun. Basically, everyone makes really bad jokes for like about two pages, and then Pilaf shows up. Yeah, so yeah, it's it, it was kind of a disappointment that they removed that pun. Uh, but yeah, so you know, this is where I feel the episode like this stuff really starts to drag out because there is. So much padding in this episode. So much. Like, there's a, there was a good bit of padding in the last episode, too, but this one, I think, really just ups it, where, um, 
what was it like? You know, they they do the whole gas cham- chamber thing, and they they get the Dragon Ball, and then they just leave the they just, they leave the room open. <sighs> so then they walk out. Yeah, they just walk out. Ah, uh, this part. Yep, this part. This part. This part. I was so confused. Continue. Yeah. So like they they leave the path open, so they just walk right out of the room that they were captured in, and. They bump into the peel-off gang, and then shenanigan, shenanigans ensue. And, like, you know, they're, they're all running Yo, around Scooby-Doo style, why, why is, and it's dumb. Why, why is there a piano, Zeon? Why piano? Yeah, that was weird. They do this whole pinball thing. Um, piano! Why is he controlling it with a piano? Yeah, no, it's dumb. It is It is so weird. It doesn't make any sense. In fact, and I think, I think like, you know, your, your statement that, like, oh, someone wanted this episode to be more serious is completely unraveled by the mere fact that this is the same episode with that stupid fucking piano scene and like i said this is my problem with filler my problem with filler a lot of the time is that no matter what you do you've always got to end up exactly where you started so even though they wanted to do some stuff and they wanted to do some more shenanigans the fact is because of the way manga manga works they can't actually escape so this has to be a completely like not only does this have to be an escape attempt that fails but this has to be an escape attempt that leaves them back at the exact same room exactly where they started with the room locked again it, it does just feel like such a complete waste of time. Yeah, it was. Oh my god. Yeah, it. Yeah, it, you, you hit the nail on the head. That's that's all I really had to say about that was just what a complete fucking time waste that whole thing was. I mean, because I don't even find it particularly funny. It just makes me look at it and go, "That's really yeah. weird." Why? Like that's all you guys could think of. And I know why this this stuff exists. It's because they're trying to get a full thirteen episode season out of this. And there just isn't enough material. You know, instead of adding, you know, they already added some pretty decent material early on, but now we're near the finale and they're trying to, like, you know, drag this out as far as they can. And they just ended up with this bullshit. And it's, yeah, it just completely derails the entire episode. That being said, the one actual, well, no, there's a few still manga stuff that they still obviously still keep in, but... One thing they do keep in, and I think that's kind of sort of important to notice, is that, like, the part where... Pilaf goes and then kidnaps Boma. And th- this is the point where, like, you know, the Toriyama twist is out there at full force, and it's like, this is the guy who has somehow managed to prepare for them, knows who they are. Like, like if you're looking at this from the manga or not from the anime, this guy is a mysterious stranger who, like, you know, has seems to, like, be really prepared and know who they are and know how to deal with them. Then they kidnap Boma. He kidnaps Boma. It's like, oh, God, this guy, this guy wants world domination. He must be evil. What is he going to do with him? And it, it's kind of like implying that Boma's going to get sexually assaulted, which, to be honest, would actually be very, very messed up, and I don't know if I would really enjoy that. But at the very least, it, it is okay because the twist is... Basically, Pilaf is a massive prude. Yeah, that was great. Um, I do love like just the really creepy build up to blowing a kiss, and then like Mai and Shu be like, "Oh, Pilaf Sama, you're so crude." It's just like, what? Oh my god! And then like Bulma is just like, "Oh, that was it. I thought you were gonna like Pafu Pafu, and then a bunch of other things." <laughs> that she said and they're like oh my god how crude is this woman and they just toss her ass back in their cell i'm gonna say also one, one other thing is like uh it's like unfortunately even though i don't really like the joke i think it did i think i did get a bit of a, a laugh out of it and that is essentially when they're kind of implying they're gonna do something to bulma and then oolong is suddenly very excited oh my god i didn't even pick up oh wait yeah i did notice that because he kind of like perks up and it's just like Oh man! Yeah, and 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 then when he and then when he gets when Bulma gets shoved back down, his ears like deflate in disappointment. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah. Which that reminds me, his ears. That scene that is insanely well animated. Like like it's it's such like a great little piece of animation where his ears just kind of like from the tips tips droop downward and it just kind of creates this weird little ripple thing in his ears and it's really well animated it's really it's a really expressive piece of animation and yeah that was that was really cool looking i actually really like that little bit but yeah it really says a lot about oolong's character and my statements about him being this creepy sexual predator who will drug girls and molest them and then wants to see them also be molested by other people against their will it's just what the fuck? 
Gulong's such a creepy character. He is. But of course, since that doesn't work, they just gas him out, and it was actually pretty simple. And of course, peel off being peel off, which this ends up kind of always being a running thing. He, he, like, like, he manages. I, I feel like we do actually need to talk about this in terms of, like, who the hell is peel off? Okay, so he manages to get it, like, have this cell for them, and Goku can't escape out of it. Like, he, he's, he has walls that are so thick that Goku can't punch through them, and that is honestly kind of surprising, given how strong Goku is. And I'm not talking about power level consistency or whatnot. I just mean, like, just generally, when somebody, like, has, like, yeah, thinks they have the upper hand against Goku, Goku just, like, low, no, really, I... I'm way stronger than you think you are, and I, I am anyway. I could totally deal with this. This time, it's like, this is why I'm so why I find Pilaf so odd. It's like this is this random mysterious guy, and he manages he manages to overpower Goku multiple times within this episode, within this arc. Like how? Yeah. It just always feels like like he always feels too competent compared to everyone else. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I, I definitely get that. I, I do think it works a little bit better in the anime just because he, you know, we do have the context that he's been watching them for a while and he knows who they are. So he's, like, can prepare. It is really weird, though, that he does have, like, like brick walls that are so thick that Goku can't bust through them. Even if he can't, like, because you'd think he'd be able to, like, you know, just keep punching the wall and just breaking it piece by piece or something, but... Exactly. And especially because later on you find out it's like right next, to, it's like it's like a wall that's like right next to the edge of the, like it is like you can see the sky when they break through it. So it's like oh yeah, it's not, it's not even right. like it must be very reinforced walls. Like geez, it's like, it's like not even like it's just like the Red Ribbon Army where they're like oh you know this is a gun but the gun is like more powerful than a regular gun. It's like this is just walls. And it's like, even later on when they get captured in the other place, and they're like, oh no, this is like made of steel and this is reinforced glass. But it's just like, no, these are just really thick walls and Goku can't punch through them. He All he can do is you do a Kamehameha and since he's so out of practice, like since that's so new to him, he can only make a really small one, which can only make a really small hole, which of course leads to Oolong and Puar going through to try and stop Pilaf. Yeah. Which is like, okay, the other thing, I'm, I'm sorry, this episode just kept bugging me. It was like, also, how do they know that Pilaf is a bad guy? Because they captured him? Because they want the Dragon Balls? Like, why do they care so much? Honestly... Or why do they care so much about Pilaf not getting his wish? Honestly, I don't think they... See, that's one of the things. Like, I don't think they actually care. I think they just want to stop his wish so they can get their wish. At least, at least from the perspective of, like, say, Bulma and Yamcha. Oh. Because they have no reason to think... Well, then again, I mean, I guess he was going to... Like torture, sexually assault, uh, Boma or whatever. I guess so, but it's like you know, you know, like if we didn't know, like I could almost totally imagine it just being like they do another twist and that like Pilaf actually wanted to wish for something really good, and they think that he's just going to wish for world domination. And he's like world domination. Why? Why would I wish for that? Right. That could. That... But then again, I guess that's kind of. I, I guess that's kind of what that was. That was kind of Yamcha's Yamcha stick already. He's like, you know, don't you want to wish world domination? Nah, I just want to. I just want to wish for. Be not not be afraid of women. Yeah. So maybe that's it. But I, I guess that actually does explain why Bomber's basically threatening Oolong to go in to try and stop the wish. It's not necessarily being like, no, we've got to do it because we've got to stop a bad guy from taking over the world. It's just more like, no, get the Dragon Balls so we can have it, so I can have the wish, okay, Oolong? And if you don't do what I am going to blackmail you and make you, you know, do the sweet sweet again. See, the thing is though, I would never want to do the pee pee candy thing to him while I'm in an enclosed room. That will only backfire on her. There's nowhere for him to go. It's a good thing Oolong didn't think about that. Right? Because it's just like, alright, but I'm just going to shit in the corner. Have fun smelling that until they let us go. <laughs> yeah, so uh, uh. I wanted to go back to uh, the scene where, Oolong, or, uh, where Pilaf first uh, interacts with them. Because the first time he interacts with them, the first time they ever speak to each other is through that monitor. Like... And uh, during that scene, uh, Pilaf mentions, like, that he is, you know, he calls himself um, uh, Pilaf Dio, you know, the, the great king Pilaf, mm -hmm. which is the first time we actually get any kind of reference to him being a king. Which is weird. Although, is he actually a king, or is the title that he gives himself? 
That's the other question. Right, yeah, yeah, that it could just be a complete bullshit title, kind of like, you know, Piccolo Daimao, like the great demon king. Exactly, exactly. It's not a literal demon, as we find out. Well, I mean, I guess he's like, since he's the evil part of God, he might as well be a demon, but, y- you know. Yeah. Long, complicated story. Yeah, so, but yeah, I thought it was kind of interesting, because I always kind of wonder where the hell the term Emperor Pilaf came from, because, you know, his, his subordinates just refer to him as... Pilaf Sama, which that's just an honorific. That's not like a title. And uh, this is the first time I've ever actually picked up on that point where he actually calls himself the Great King Pilaf. So yeah, I just thought that was kind of interesting. So I was like, oh, I guess that's kind of where they got the Emperor Pilaf thing from his title because I've always been against calling him Emperor Pilaf because he's not an emperor. He never calls himself an emperor. And that, and even after this, I don't think the whole King Pilaf or Great King Pilaf thing ever comes up again. He's just Pilaf, or Pilaf-sama, depending on who's speaking to him. But yeah, um, also, fun fact, uh, in the scene where Bulma is, like, quote, sexually tortured, uh, and she starts listing off all those things, I tried to look those things up because I was curious what the hell those were. Those are apparently just some bullshit Toriyama made up, except for maybe Pafu Pafu. And then then isn't Pafu Pafu, like, something that's... I was also wondering about, like, cause, like, isn't that a thing that was, like, in Dragon Quest as well? And that's, like, a joke, but then it's, like, is that just because that's a Toriyama thing? Or was that always a thing? Or is that, like, a Japanese thing? I- I'm curious about that. I wonder if somebody knows the answer. This is also what I use this podcast for. Just, ask, like, saying random questions and hoping that somebody in the comment section will answer me. Yeah, because, like, the Pafu Pafu thing, I have heard referenced at least in one other anime, and that was uh, Yakitate Japan, that bread one. Um, so, like, you know, so Pafu Pafu was, was referenced in that, so, so it's apparently a thing, but is it a thing because of Dragon Ball? Did Toriyama make up a Pafu Pafu thing, and, like, did it never just have a name? Because, I mean, you know, I don't know, that was just kind of weird, and I thought it was kind of, well, I thought it was weird that the other ones were just completely made up bullshit, that just don't have, that just aren't actual things, and it's just things that Toriyama had, um... Bulma say in that scene because they, they, they apparently just don't really mean anything but yeah that's a little thing I noticed but yeah this episode uh, ends on the summoning of Shenlong Ooh, yes let's talk about this let's talk about it. it looks so good it looks so good right yeah yeah it was great stuff like this is this is a really great animated episode it was it looked really nice and yeah just they like yeah you know, they, they do the um it's like you know the, the dragon being summoned and you know, he's, like, you, you see him, like, take the form of lightning first, and then he kind of, like, forms into, like, the dragon, like, underneath the lightning, you see him silhouetted. And, yeah, it is hype as shit, and you have every, you know, you have uh, Oolong and Puar, like, in their bat forms, trying to, like, get to Pilaf first. Uh, also, there's Oolong's dick for some reason. Thanks, Toriyama. Ooh! I didn't add that to my calendar. I need to add that to my calendar afterwards. I, I, cause my calendar's just Goku's dick, but maybe it should just be like dick shots. Yeah, I was say, well, I think that's yeah, because it shows up both in this episode and the episode after, where you just see him, cause like he, he's, cause he's naked in his bat form, and Toriyama felt the need to draw his dick. <laughs> Thank you, Thanks Toriyama. Thanks for that. <laughs> Thanks for deciding we needed that. <laughs> you know, I don't know why it isn't, like, curly like his tail, but oh well. Please don't. Oh, God, no. Uh, why, why, did you have to, why did you have to say that? Because <laughs> I'm a bad person who says bad things on the internet. Uh, okay, but yeah, Dragon Summoning animation is so good. It's so good that, in fact, in the manga and the anime, it is drawn twice, and both times are slightly different, and both times are awesome. Yeah, it is so hype as shit, though. Like, like they really, they really, you know, nailed it. Uh, my only thing that bothers me a little bit is, like, as you just point out, in episode 12, they go back over this. And I feel like, it's like, well, I, I, they kind of already spoiled the dragon reveal in the previous episode. I kind of wish that they had kept him fully silhouetted, because, um, Mm. because he starts off silhouetted, but just as the episode ends, the silhouette fades, and you can just see a full shot of Shenlong, and I'm like... I kind of wish they had kept him in silhouette because as we move into episode 12, it's a much longer sequence. They really build up the summoning. Like, and let me just say, the storyboarding in this episode is fantastic. Like, you have Pilaf 
uh, like a downward shot, looking up at Pilaf, the light kind of lumin- uh, illuminating him from the Dragon Balls mm. from underneath. And it's this great pose of him, like raising his arms up. And, you know, once again, another great uh, animated episode. Uh, probably just as good as any other. Because, ep- like, I would say all four of these episodes look great. Mm. And it's, it's been a really good, strong run of episodes. And. But specifically here, the storyboarding I thought was great because you have Pilaf center of frame, his castle in the background, uh, also center of frame, and it just there's a lot of great dynamic shots in this episode, and it looks really really good. But uh, like the summoning sequence, it's a lot longer, and I think it's really great build up, but it's build up that's deflated because we saw Shenlong at the end of the last episode, and that's why I feel like. If they were going to redo that whole summoning sequence, don't show a Shenlong, keep it a mystery, and, you know, you know that way, like, the build-up... Because I feel like it's really good build-up. I mean, it's really distended, but... And, you know, like, like, the summoning sequence is bigger and grander and longer, and that's cool, but I just wish... Uh, I just wish that they hadn't shown a Shenlong because it kind of really deflates that one episode later. You know, this is reminding me of a certain thing that the anime also did in a certain key scene in Dragon Ball Z that kind of really pissed me off, and in that case it was even more egregious, but we're not going to get to that for multiple, multiple years. So... <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah. Um, yeah, storyboard... You guys, know which, you guys yeah. know which moment I'm talking about. Good Actually, job for you. Never mind. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, like, like I said, storyboarding, awesome. Um... You know, like the longer summoning sequence, it's awesome too. I love it. It's just like I said, having already seen Shenlong, it kind of deflates some of that. And yeah, like I said, I think I think it might be because the manga did that as well. Like I'm just looking through it now, and they do that at the end of the last episode. They have a thing of Shenlong, and then the end, of, and then the start of the next episode, they 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 sort of recap it, and then they do a different reveal reveal panel of Shenlong. So I think that's partially why they did it. But then the anime storyboarding is slow, is completely different for both of those anyway. So. I don't even know. Right. Yeah. And like I said, though, like this episode looks really impressive. And guess who was, uh, was like the animator on this one? Maeda. Ibisawa. Wait, really? What? Holy shit. This is an Ibisawa episode. Jeez. And I thought, and I thought that the art looked especially good and it was Ibisawa. Oh, wow. I need a hand in my Dragon Ball animation. Yeah, no. I had. Following card. I had. Yeah, I had no fucking clue that this was fucking Ebisawa. Like, I was just like, man, this episode looks so good. And I think a lot of what makes this episode look so especially good is the um, is the storyboarding. But, like, even the art doesn't look bad. It's on model. I always thought, so, that, I thought the art looked especially good that episode. Am I just wrong? Twitch said it'll have taste. I don't know. Maybe Ebisawa isn't actually that bad. I don't I mean, know. This is making me well, it, question it, my life choices. It isn't actually, but... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it just depends on, like, who was animating with him, who he had on his staff, I would assume, is what makes the big difference here. Because, let's see, that was episode 12. So, yeah. And... Yeah, hold on. Let me see. Yeah, animation... Wasn't he for, wasn't he for five? Hmm? Episode five was the first one? So he had... <sighs> Ooh, excuse me. Um... He did episode five was the first one, Ebisawa episodes. Oh, and if there's episode twelve, that's seven weeks. Yeah. The usual stretch. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, let me see, cause maybe that's just more than usual. Cause sometimes in Z they had they have like four weeks each episode or something like that, or at least like I don't know, I don't know. Yeah. So yeah, looking through uh, the Kanzenshu, uh, or uh, basically I'm just going through the arcs. And yeah, like it says, animation. And this one actually has a storyboard artist. This one has a separate storyboard artist. I'm noticing that, like, Kanzushi doesn't have storyboard artists listed for every episode. So I'm guessing some episodes may just not have a story, a direct storyboard artist, and then for specific ones, they do. This one clearly did. Because, like I said, like, the storyboarding is amazing. And shit, I clicked the wrong episode. But yeah, like, it says, like, for, like, and like I was bringing up before, like, it says, Ebisawa is the animator. But then when I go to um, key animations and in-betweens... Oh, yeah, yeah. Ebisawa is also listed as one of the three key animators Jeez, for this episode. Huh. So he, at very least, did like a third of this episode. And I think I know what third of the episode he oh, did. I'm yep. pretty sure he was responsible... 
for when Filler. like they're, they're they're doing the attack with the wolves. I didn't think it was that. Oh, actually, no. To, to be fair, no. I, I think there was some points where I thought it looked good. Again, some points I thought it was a bit lazy. And yeah, okay. But okay, we, we, before we talk about the wolves, can we just talk about so like basically, essentially the big climax of the arc? Oh yeah. Pilaf is about to get. He is about to get his wish on the dragon laws, and at the very last moment, Oolong steps in and asks for the panties of a hot babe. Yep. And he gets the wish, and he steals the wish from Pilaf, and essentially Oolong saves the day. Yeah. See, that is great. I, I really love that just this art kind of ends on this weird anticlimactic joke. Uh, I, I, think, I think it works really well. And it's stuff like this I feel works really well as opposed, you know, because Dragon Ball is like a sillier series, and it can kind of get away, like especially, well, specifically like early Dragon Ball is so silly that they can totally get away with something like this, where, like things like, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna have to talk about Super for just a little oh, bit. No. Uh, okay, let me just bury my head in my book. All right, uh, you know, in in Super when they do the rock paper scissors gag with Oolong, that's a that's half an episode's worth of... Oh, God, and you're talking about the Battle of God's Ark? Oh, no. Yeah, yeah. Well, because this, is this I think, is, like, a good comparison because, you know, by this point in the story, we know that, um... We know that, um... That Oolong is not going to have an effect on this story. So Oolong taking up half an episode on a rock-paper-scissor gag is a complete and utter waste of time. I love that you're, like, so upset about this. You're still talking about it two years later. Oh, yeah. No, like, I was fuming angry that that episode wasted my time. <laughs> like, like, because I think that gag is funny in Battle of Gods, the movie, because it's, like, 90 seconds. It doesn't overstay its welcome. When you make it, like, this big 10-minute ordeal, God, no, it's terrible. But the thing is, though, like, that gag, uh, that, that taking up so much time, it just feels like this big waste. Here... You know, you know when Oolong is like, oh no, it's Oolong to save the day. Oolong actually can save the day. Because Dragon Ball's just that silly. Like, early Dragon Ball could get away with that. And we know that by the time we get to Battle of Gods, you can't have that. Like, you know, Oolong couldn't be the one. Like, you know, if that movie had ended on a gag scene of, you know, Oolong winning rock, paper, scissors, that's not, like, you know... I would probably think it's funny. Um, I think a lot of other people would be fucking irate. Most people would probably lose their shit. Um, but, you know, here, you know, Oolong can be the hero. Oolong actually gets to be the hero. Probably morally the worst person in this series, and I'm including the Pilaf gang in this set. Well, the worst character, the, the, the morally worst character in this arc, including the Pilaf gang... Oolong, of all people, is the one that got to save the day. And I, th I think that's really cool I, I th that Toriyama took, like, the worst character in this storyline and got to make him the hero by doing something completely sleazy and self-serving, which is still totally in line with his character. In fact, you know, like, I think the, the thing that I really kind of especially love about this is like, just the way that it's sort of... I mean, it's not necessarily even presented like this. In fact, this might even be almost me looking too far into it. But what I love about it is it, just the entire situation. It's like, Pilaf is about to get his wish. He is going to he is going to go and rule the world. Something terrible is going to happen. No one else can do anything. Pular is shit scared of the dragon. And nobody really knows what they're doing. And suddenly, it's Oolong. Oolong who suddenly just sort of realizes he's the only person who suddenly realizes, wait, if I go in there... And if I go up to the dragon, and if I get the wish, then he's not going to get the wish. And it's Oolong who's the one person who realizes it. Oolong, the guy who, uh, up until this point, in fact, he would often run away from the fight the moment that he thought that, like, he was, like, he wouldn't be able to do anything. He ran away from the fight with the rabbit gang, so, but Oolong, here, this one moment, it's like the coward, essentially, goes up and he goes and he stands up when nobody else could. Like, I, I love that. I love those moments, like, when that happens. And even though in Dragon Ball, it puts a spin on it because basically Oolong still pretty much saves the day by being such a massive pervert that he thinks about that. And that's the first wish that he can think of. And perhaps that's part of the reason as to why he's so eager to get the wish. But still, I love that. Yeah. I love those moments. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you on that. Like, I think it's, 
you know, I think it's like a great moment for his character. Like I said, it still keeps him within character while also getting to save the day. It's a great little twist. And yeah, it's it's great. It's a like I said, it's a great moment for his character. It's a great moment within the arc itself. It's a great kind of pull the rug at a uh, rug out from under you anti climax that uh, I really like. Yeah, it, it it works on a lot of levels for me. And yeah, I I think uh, yeah I think that was good. I, I liked how they did that. I don't know if a lot of other people agree, but I I do. And I, I also love the fact that the Dragon Balls. These things are the name... Like, this is... It, it is what the series is named after. And this arc has been building up to... And, it, and like, you know, like I said, like the, the, the series is called Dragon Ball. And the very first wish these things grant in this series, in this franchise, uh, is, is, a pair of hot, uh, is a pair of panties off of a hot babe. That's great. That, that's so Toriyama. It is so Toriyama. I love it. You know, you, you take take something that sounds incredibly fantastic and then do something so mundane with it, you kind of remember. Oh, right. It's not everything's like... It, it almost just, like, brings you back to reality. Sort of like, oh, yeah, no. Dragon Balls can make you have dumb wishes as well. Pervy wishes. Yeah, yeah. Everything. Yeah, no, it's it's yeah, it's great. It's, it is it, it is brilliance out of just the most bare-bones, childish simplicity. And I think that's kind of where, like, Toriyama is at his best. Whenever he's just doing something really simple that kind of switches your expectations and it's just it's like yeah no that totally makes sense but i was i wasn't expecting that no i i, I do you. wonder if toriyama was like thinking about this was going to be the way it was going to end the entire time because in fact it's almost like dragon ball z like after goku goes super saiyan against frieza from this point onwards the arc is pretty much over yeah because, like, I mean, at this point, like, they go and, um, like, I mean, they, they get captured again, and then they kind of escape, but then after they leave, like, this is the climax. Like, at this point, like, everything else is just kind of busy work to make sure that, like, everything works out in the end, but it's like, this is, like, the big moment. In fact, this is, like, if you're going to remember anything out of this arc, it's basically this moment. Yeah. It's the first wish. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, there, there's another moment after this, after this, but, like, that's a little bit different. I guess we'll... We'll talk about it, but okay. After this, I've got to say, this is when the anime starts losing steam because it tries to do filler, and it's filler that honestly, it, it makes sense because basically, uh, in the manga, after that point, after they just go and, um, after the wish gets granted, the, the, he basically, basically just tells Peel off and Shu, he basically tells um, Shu and Mai to go and get them, and they basically just cuts ahead immediately to them all being captured. And it's like, I guess it does ask, you know, raise the question as to like, how did they all get captured? And the only really question is just like, you know, Oolong and Puar had a really crap escape attempt because like they're not very good at this. And, but it's like, the, the anime, like they try to make it a big deal, and I do enjoy some things, but it does raise a whole bunch of questions. Like, how does Shu, a talking dog ninja, have a dog squad? I mean, I thought it made sense. I mean, you know, he, he he's in tune with the dogs. But like, he's a, he's a ninja. He's a dog. He, he's a dog that walks on two legs and can talk. And he controls dogs that walk on four legs and don't talk. Is, is there some kind of, like, animal racism here? Well, no, because, you know, because it's not even like, like they're smart dogs who can talk. You know, it's just, they're just dogs. You know, uh, I, I mean, I never really thought about it that much. I was just like, oh, yeah, yeah, he's a dog ninja. He has, like, a dog army. Gotcha. Cool. Uh, but, yeah, no, like, I honestly, like, I kind of enjoy this bit of filler. I think it works a hell of a lot better than the filler from the two previous episodes. Because the first, because the last two episodes. Yeah, why? Because the last two episodes, you know, even, like, you know, the whole, like, them sneaking around Pilaf's castle, you know, when nothing is happening, it's just, it's boring as all hell. I mean, and that's only... I think when they first get to the castle, like, maybe only, like, a few minutes of that's filler, and it just, it feels like it takes forever, except for, like, you know, the thing with, like, the pillars and stuff, where, like I said, Yamcha gets his cool moment, and, you know, and we get to see a little bit of kung fu martial arts stuff going on, but, like, the last ep like, the episode before this one, it was horrible, like, that whole, like, them running around stuff, it's, like, ten minutes of filler content, and, like, you know, like, I, I am the guy who will get up on his soapbox and defend the filler to, you know, defend its honor like some white knight on the internet. But even this, like, you know, that was really bad filler in that last episode. This, I feel, I feel like, you know, at very least, it gives us context into how they got captured, 
you know, how these three complete idiotic buffoons are able to capture, especially Yamcha, capturing Bulma, not that difficult. Uh, Poir and Oolong and a hungry Goku who can barely move, not that difficult. Uh, capturing Yamcha, how do you do that? Like, he's a competent martial artist, he's not weakened in any state, so it really makes him seem, uh, like, incompetent and really weak, the fact that these three idiots were able to catch him without us having context for how they caught them. Yeah, and, and the answer is, like, it's a pretty good context, it's just they, they threaten Boma, so of course they go with him, like, it's one of those, like, oh, duh, oh, right, yeah, yeah I guess so, Boma wouldn't really be able to fight back if there, she's got a gun to her head, like, or a sword, or whatever it was. I think it was both. You know, like, that makes sense. And so, of course, yeah. they get captured, and they get... Of course, Pilaf, like all anime villains, decides to do an elaborate plan of... A very elaborate plan, which would take a very long time to actually kill the heroes instead of just killing them outright, and, of course, that leads... That backfires, but, you know. Yeah. This is, I would say this is, this is probably the first outright, legitimately evil thing Pilaf's done in this entire arc. <laughs> because like like he he's done like questionable things and you know he's yeah he's threatened his subordinates but at no point do you honestly feel like he's going to legitimately kill the only people who will actually listen to him so you know when when he's like you know when he's just like oh yeah no like i'm just gonna go to sleep and the sun is gonna roast them alive. Like, that's one, that's a horrible fucking way to go, is burned alive of all fucking things, slowly cooked alive in, like, a hot box. And, like, it's not even like, you know, he's, like, gonna get some sort of sadistic pleasure out of it. No, he's gonna sleep through it. By the time he wakes up, they're gonna be dead, as far as he's concerned. So, yeah, like, this is just, like, a legitimately, like, out of... Out of the entire franchise, this is like the one legitimately evil thing Pilaf has done. I guess I can't think of anything else he does that's on this level. Except for like release King Piccolo or the Demon King Piccolo and even that. But he didn't even like, yeah, he, he, he had no idea what that was going to happen. Yeah, he was no. like, hey, can you give us some of the world as well? And then he like, they pretty much start regretting it immediately when they realize how evil actually yeah. Piccolo actually is. So like even that, like you can't even say is just like on par. No, this is just, yeah. So yeah, um, you know, in like, so while they're on, uh, while they're in that little enclosed room, uh, we get the one year rule for the Dragon Balls. Uh, we find out that, like, you know, the Dragon Balls, after a year, they they go, or, like, the Dragon Balls, after you wish on them, they go inert for a whole year, or uh, a year or more, is what Bulma says. So even Bulma isn't exactly clear on that. So, you know, she just, I guess she just knows the legend of the Dragon Balls. And so, so we get that rule, and then we also get uh, Goku's lore about the monster that killed his grandfather. Oh, this is... This is this is so like messed up. This is so messed up. It is. And it's so messed up. Like it's such a weird like both in how this scene is delivered and just kind of what it means for the characters, specifically Goku. It's such an odd moment because Goku obliviously is talking about how, "Oh yeah, on a full moon, this monster comes out and a rampage and, you know, it killed my grandpa. It killed, it killed my grandpa. He's a real... It's a real monster. Oh, what's the monster like? I don't know. I was always asleep. I never saw it. Goku... Were... Did did you look at the full moon when your... Like, when your grandpa died? And he goes, Oh, yeah, only for a little bit. I don't remember what happened after that, though. And it's, it's at that point that you start getting... Because, like, you along with the audience start realizing what's going on. Like, I wish I could have experienced this this completely fresh. Having no clue about Goku's lineage and where he's going to end up as a character. Because I can only imagine just the audience being like, what, what's the point of the story Goku's telling? I don't get it. Wait a second. Goku was told not to look at the moon. Oh, no. Oh no. And you start having that reaction along with the audience and then he looks at the moon. And then and nothing this, happens at yeah, first. Oh, I loved that fake out. The fake out was amazing. It's just like, oh, okay, good. Thank, oh, thank God. Oh, look, see, nothing actually happened. And then suddenly he just freezes and his eyes turn red and you're like, 
Then he's just like, it's a slow, just like heartbeat. Yeah. And then suddenly, just like, like you know, it's like you know, it's this great build up. Like, okay, what the hell's gonna happen to him? What even is this monster? And then it happens, and then it's a giant monkey. It yeah. Turns into a giant monkey. Of course. And it's like, what's? I mean, yeah, I guess giant monkey. I guess makes sense. He's got a monkey tail. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Uh, 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 this is the main character, and he just turned into a monster. Yeah. Yeah, it's so weird. It's because, like, I mean, you know, like we have the context that Toriyama will original will later give us, but just in the context of this storyline, what the fuck, man? Like Goku goes from, oh, I'm just a kid in the woods, to, oh, also I can turn into a giant monkey monster that rampages, and I, also I killed my grandfather. He killed his grandfather. Holy sh- it it take in fact yeah. it, it takes him up until the fight with Vegeta. To actually find that out. That he killed his own yeah. father figure. That is so messed yeah. up. And I mean Dragon Ball has some messed up stuff. But this is one of the most messed up things. In fact the fact that Goku. This you know innocent kid. Yes. Is also secretly this evil terrifying monster. And he doesn't even know. It, it, it really like taints your opinion of him. Throughout the entire series. Well up until Z. When it, it basically gets a bit kind of softened. But like. It's so messed up. <laughs> yeah, no. Like, it's, it's it's amazing, like, just how long Goku goes without... Because, I mean, he even comes face-to-face with his grandfather. And his grandfather doesn't tell him. Of course he... Uh, at all. Like, I mean, I could almost understand why, like, he doesn't doesn't want him to get upset about it. But, yes, like... You know, this is, this yeah. is one of those things where I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm glad that the, Sa- that the Saiyans exist. I'm, I'm glad they explained it. And I'm glad they explained it in a way that wasn't as, like, terrifying as they kind of present it it is in this story where it actually just feels like goku is this monster and he can't con- and you can't stop him from being a monster even if he's like yeah oh, oh. like like th- there are things in dragon ball that rub me the wrong way and sometimes those are good and sometimes those are bad i feel like this is a this is a pretty okay one but yeah oh god so yeah see honestly he's the main character he's on the cover of everything and he's also a monster yeah yeah he's this uncontrollable you know he, he's like the hulk He's like the Hulk. If the Hulk were God, or it's like the if the Hulk could turn into uh, King Kong, that's what he is. It's, it's worse than the Hulk though, because he doesn't know he's doing it. He doesn't know he's hurting all these people. Yeah, Goku, the most oh, the most God. innocent, wide eyed, you know, dopey protagonist in like the history of anime, is this literal monster, and he's completely oblivious, and nobody wants to tell him because that's horrible. You don't want to drop that kind of shit on a twelve year old boy. Like, oh, by the way... Because I think he's you're... 14, but yes, yeah, no. <laughs> still. Like, this little kid, like, you don't want to drop some shit. Like, oh, by the way, you're a monster, and by the way, you also killed your grandfather, and you almost killed us. Like, that is... I mean, hey, they they, they did they did drop that bomb on him, and he was very conflicted on it. You know when he did that? You know when they did that? Mm. Wait. In Dragon Ball Evolution. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, you know we're going to have to watch that for this podcast at some point, right? <laughs> Oh, all right. Bring That's going to be a bonus episode. I don't, episode. I don't even. I don't even drink much alcohol. Bring the alcohol. <laughs> so yeah, um, yeah, just but yeah. I mean, like, yeah, it, it it's so weird. And in fact, I think it's the thing. And I think I just checked, and I think it's in the manga as well. And then like they put it in the narration, the anime, where they say like, you know, even the writer didn't know this was going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that. I mean, I don't know if that's I don't know if that's talking about Toriyama or Toei, but yeah, no, I didn't expect this was going to happen. It's so weird. It's yeah, no, like yeah, it's it's such a yeah because th- this breaks like every kind of storytelling convention. Like you don't you don't make your main character this weird monster thing. Even like in Naruto, where like you know he has like the spirit of like this fox demon, it never manifests in such a way like this does, where he literally just turns into a monster and he's this uncontrollable force of nature that just nobody can stop. And he can't trigger it on Like, it, it triggers completely accidentally, yeah. basically. A- accidentally. Yeah. Like, uh, like, just think about all... Like, it makes you uh, ask all these questions. Like, how many close calls were there? How many times have he t- had he turned to the monster and he just doesn't realize it because there was no one around and then, the, like, the, the night was over and, like, he just didn't realize it. Just one day he just, like, passed out and his clothes were gone. Like, 
there's so many questions. Yeah. I don't know if it's, yeah. like, it, it, it's why it's just so weird to me. It is, it is one of the weirdest things in the series. Yes, even weirder than, even weirder than, like, everything else, even weirder than Margin Boo, even weirder than the ending of the Future Trunks arc. And this was, like, in the first arc of Dragon Ball. Yeah, no, like, I think this really kind of, I think this is still one of the weirdest, bizarre moments, especially just in the terms of just conventional storytelling. Yeah, because, like, even, because, I mean, it's not like Sung Wukong turns into a giant, rampaging rage monster. I mean, he, he has, I, I think he does, like, I, I think he's, he can turn into a giant monster, but I don't think he ever, like, goes on a rampage and, like, actually yeah, no, I don't know. himself. It's more just like he's... Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah, it's just, it's just yeah. wild. This is like I said from my brief. Yeah, it's just like my brief knowledge of Journey to the West, but it, it it might kind of sort of be a reference to Journey to the West in that way, but yeah, not in this way, not not in this so yeah. messed up. And way. thing is, though, like when they portray him transforming, it's kind of horrific. Like first off, oh, it's first, terrifying. First off, I want to bring oh. up the story, the way they animated. Yeah, I want to bring up like the storyboarding again because the storyboarding is really fantastic because you have Goku just kind of center of frame. Big smile on his face, wide eyed. Why? What's? Why are you guys asking these cool? Like, what, like you know, what? You know, and he's just like telling this happy little story. It's like, oh, oh no, I, 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 you know, I don't know anything about this monster. And oh yeah, I looked at the moon this one time. Why are you asking? And it's just, oh dear God. And like you see the moon in the background, and then like the 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 the, the angle changes, and you get this low shot where Goku's partially in frame, and they're in the corner huddled in fear, and it's it's so well storyboarded. It's so well paced, and then when you get that moment where he looks into the moon, and he, like I said, you get that fake out, and then the like that electrical spark happens, and the heartbeat is dun dun, dun dun, dun dun, and he starts his chest starts expanding, his fangs start growing in, and his face starts deforming, and it's just like what the fuck is happening? Like it is. It is something like out of like a like it is like David Cronenberg levels of body horror going on in this episode, and it's so well done. It's so good, and it's happening to the hero. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, I, and okay, I, I feel like I need to just stop rambling on this, but like, oh, it is so weird. It is so weird. yeah, no, and it's so messed up. And I, I, I do like I said, I do appreciate the Saiyans for pretty much kind of softening the blow of it because it's a pretty big blow. Yeah, no, this is like one of the wildest things in the entire franchise. And, you know, it won't get explained for years. So it's wild. It's wild as yep. hell to think that Toriyama just threw this thing in here. Just, I mean, as far as we know, he had no intention on ever explaining that. Like, you know, hell, he probably didn't even know what the hell it meant. Yeah, like I said, he's like, he, when they sort of saying, like, even the author's surprised by this. Yeah, I don't know if Toriyama had an explanation. I feel like it was just kind of just thrown in there because why the hell not? That's how he writes it. I feel like that's how he writes these stories. He just does this. But, yeah. So that's the end of the episode. The end of the episode is him turning into the monster. We, there's actually still one more episode. We obviously it's yeah, you know, four episodes each kind of meant that we're going to have to you know end the ep- the end of the arc off next week or next podcast episode. So yeah, so so yeah, ne- the next podcast we'll be talking about the finale of this arc and then going into the 21st century Budokai. Uh, before we end this, I do want to read a few comments because I said we were going to read you know good comments if we had any. Oh yeah. I, I thought we were like, oh, maybe we're not going to make it 90 minutes this time. Whoops. Nope, we're not. Let's, okay. Nope, Let's nope, comment because, time. And I was looking at it. I was just like, oh, awesome. We're actually going to try and keep it. No, because we're going to do some comment reading. Uh, the first one comes from, uh, I don't know how to, it's JMZ Awesomeness. And okay, so I mentioned uh, talking about uh, Japan. You know, I, I brought up, you know, like in the first podcast about uh uh, katakana and kanji and how it's like you know it's borrowed from like the japanese and whatnot or it's borrowed from the chinese and uh he specifically states uh he tosses out there as someone who speaks japanese let me give you uh let me give context for a long time japan did not have a written system for a while they borrowed chinese characters from china because uh it was taught by foreign monks and japanese who traveled abroad uh back in the heian period katakana and hiragana began to be prominent, which is why modern Japanese uh, involves a hybridization of three alphabets. So you are per, uh, so you are partially correct about Chinese and Japanese. Also, many kanji in Dragon Ball is not katakana, or, uh, sorry, uh, also above many kanji in Dragon Ball is not katakana, but is actually furigana uh, most of the time. And also he says, yes, Mr. Fusion deserves... Uh, uh, 
deserves like ultimate respect. Uh, yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of cool that I now have context. Yeah, because because I didn't really know like the full thing on there. Like I, I I am not a history major, and I just know that that Japan got their alphabet from China. That is like the extent of what I knew. Um, also, uh, I actually did know about furigana. Uh, I just uh, furigana. Uh, I just I fucked up and I said katakana, and. After I had said it, and you started talking, Gabby, I was just like, did I say katakana? I don't realize. I don't know. Shit. Sorry. You and should then, have interrupted and me. Then, <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Like, I was thinking about it, and I was just like, because I wasn't sure if I had fucked that up, and I was just like, did I say, whatever. And then I heard it back in the audio, and I actually considered recording over myself and saying <laughs> uh, Furigana, because I knew I'd fuck ah, that up. come on. We've got to be authentic here. Even yeah, I was, I was just like, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to leave my fuck up in there. And hey, someone, someone... Someone, someone got to correct me, so someone got to feel good on that one. Be like, ah, I, actually, I don't think he tried. I don't think he's being smug, but <laughs> you know. So yeah, we all learned a little bit of something, and that's cool. Uh, let's see. Uh, what is the song at the beginning of the podcast uh, that from JoJo Banks? Uh, that is the original Ocean Group uh, theme to Dragon Ball. Ocean Group. Uh, I, I've mentioned this dub a few times now. Uh, they dubbed like the first thirteen episodes, the peel off arc, and for that, they had their own theme song, and basically, I just kind of short, super shortened it down to like a few seconds, and that is what uh, we're using for the intro theme. Let's see, and do we have any other noteworthy ones that I wanted to read? I know there's a, because I went thumbs up. Oh, okay, so Mr. Fusion himself, Lance, also commented. Uh... He said, uh, Danny's been telling me for years that Super is where the money's at, uh, where the views are at. But trust me, uh, I'm not being some self-sacrificing martyr. It took me over a year and a half to, just to get caught up with everyone else watching that series. Uh, I haven't seen any single episode more than once, and I find myself blanking out even during that uh, one viewing. Uh... As a result, there's just no flipping way I could talk about Super right now at the same level I talk about a series that I've been following for 20 years. Uh, I'd, I'd be downright embarrassed to put out any Super videos or put out any yes, put out any Super videos up right now. So, yeah, so I, I mean, I'm not gonna like you know like get up on this soapbox and be like, oh, he's such a hero for what he does, but I do respect the fact that I mean, yes, he may not have you, you may not have a lot to say about Super, but that doesn't necessarily stop anyone else. If you look at 99% of the videos that are talking about Dragon Ball Super, they're kind of just vapid. Like, I don't talk about the discussion videos. Reviews are, are a completely different thing, but, you know, like, like all these topics that people bring up about Super, they're usually the most vapid kind of Reddit level, just 14 year olds conversing about Dragon Ball, like in between classes, kind of discussions they're nothing thought-provoking nothing meaningful which is why i kind of have an issue with the majority of dragon ball videos that are being put out these days and yeah i mean you know lance could easily do that too and that combined with his dragon ball dissections could make him one of the biggest in this community but he chooses not to because he knows he doesn't have that much to say and even he says like you know it would be embarrassing to put out videos like that and honestly I respect the fact that he acknowledges that and that he doesn't want to be that. What time did you get Lance so, yeah. on here? Like, maybe, maybe not, not obviously, like, like a bonus thing or something. At, at this point, I feel like we're oh, yeah. like talking about him more than like half of everything else we should be talking about. <laughs> right, yeah. Honestly, though, I do want to say that uh, I'm going to talk to him at some point because I really want to get him on for the... Whenever we eventually get to the bonus episodes and we do Sleeping Princess and Devil's Castle because that's his favorite movie. Oh, okay. We gotta get him. Yeah, we, we can't. We gotta get him on for that one. So, Lance, if you're listening, this is my formal invite. And if you're not la uh, listening to this one, uh, I will just message you on Facebook or uh, Twitter or something or Skype. Oh, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, Born to Run brings up uh, uh, as bad as Uchiyama's animation was, he was basically holding uh, holding up the schedule for the show. Maya's high quality animation is, of course, great, and it would be great if all of Dragon Ball looked like it. Uh, but to keep such a big series going, you need people who are capable of hammering out episodes quickly. And yeah, I, I get that. Like, you know, weekly series, blah, blah, blah. But my issue is, like, Toei being as big as they are, the fact that they're outsourcing to so many people, instead of outsourcing, like, say, 
like, you know, episodes of Uchiyama, they could have gone to other better studios. Well, I, and I, I don't, I mean, like, I don't know, but it's like, I feel like it wouldn't actually happen. There was like, I feel like they wouldn't have taken, like, maybe other studios just can't do it this quickly. Like, that's the thing. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, I'm not saying... Like instead of giving, instead of giving, like I, I, I'm sorry. I, I just get a bit, I just get a bit defensive when people are like, "Oh no, Toei's just too cheap. They purposely made things worse for them. They didn't, couldn't be bothered to put enough money into it." And I'm just like, guys, guys, like, it's a cheap thing. Yeah, sure, but yeah, like, I, also, I, I'm pretty sure they want to make a good product. I don't think they want to make a bad product. Yeah, it's just you know. Like, right now in Dragon Ball, I'm fine with how the animation's been going. Like, even, like, that one Uchiyama episode wasn't abysmal. But later on, it's going to get really, really apparent when it's Uchiyama, when it's Ibisawa. And and I feel like when that started becoming an issue, I think they should have started looking towards other studios. Maybe not necessarily studios that are faster. You know, because in that case, get a couple more studios involved. And you just, instead of giving, like, like you know, two episodes to Uchiyama, just take those two episodes and distribute them to two other so uh, studios, because you're, I mean, they're already outsourcing their animation as is, so it's not like... But, I mean, I mean, they were, like, they were putting, they were getting new studios in, like, you know, like, like Studio Cockpit and stuff, like, they, they, I think they only showed up, like, middle of Dragon Ball Z, maybe, I feel like they didn't already start, I feel like the first episode I remember, I remember them doing was, like, in the Cell Saga, so, like, I feel like they were actually trying, so I, I don't... I don't exactly know. Also, like, I, I feel like I don't know enough context to just say, like, oh, no, Toei just didn't do the right thing kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, like I said, you know, it's it's not a big deal. I understand, like, you know, they're there to hold up the, you know, the animation, you know, and, you know, keep the keep the production steady. But, yeah, like I said, like, I feel like they could have outsourced to a few other people. Also, Born to Run mentions, this is your third attempt at covering the original series. Soon I will know more about your opinions on the first arc than I do my own. Yeah. So right, just, this is why we need, we need to get to next episode a, a, ASAP because then we're yeah. actually we're actually going to see your opinions over things that aren't just the first doc. Right. Yeah. We're we're almost there, and I mean I've already mentioned the tournament arc before, but I get to like talk about it on a more episode by episode basis, so that's going to be cool. And um, you know, like the red ribbon arc. Other other than I love the red ribbon arc, nobody knows my opinion on that. So I'm really looking forward to getting to those because then I get to talk about something I haven't really been able to talk about in detail. So yeah, so yeah, I do like the fact that so that like one person knows it's like this is my third attempt at trying to cover this fucking show. Um, but yeah, uh, then let's see. Murdyville asked, "Why is anime Z on black?" Um, okay, so if you notice in the character portrait, my skin color is really fucking dark in that portrait. And in the original, um, uh, when I was drawing it in the program, it is not that dark skinned. Like, I am naturally tan. I don't, I don't know how well it shows up because of the bright lighting I'm always under in videos. And how I kind of try to up the brightness in videos. But, um, like, I, I, I am Indian. I am, I am half Indian, so I am naturally tan. And I was trying to convey that in the image... But for some reason, every time I would save the image and every time I'd put it on a background and like, you know, just through saving the images, it just, it always comes out darker. So by episode, by this episode, it will not be that. <laughs> so that is, that is the story behind that. Like it was not supposed to look like that. And I was already up to the point, like when I had rendered the video, I had noticed how dark I looked and I was just like, man, that just doesn't look right at all. But it was, I had already rendered the video and I wasn't going to go back and fix it. So the next time I will not look quite so uh, Polynesian. Wait, does my one look the same? I don't know. I, I think you gave. I, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours, yours had a, like a. I thought I only was like on the actual images. My skin tone is only like maybe like a shade or two darker than yours. But for some reason, when I saved them, it came out way darker. I'm not sure why. Okay, yeah, that's weird. Uh, I mean, because I think somebody was mentioning that I looked, I looked a bit darker than usual, or like I looked pretty dark, and they're asking me about what my skin tone is. I'm like, no, really, I'm, I'm pretty light skinned. I mean, I guess I'm a little bit olivey, kind of, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty white skinned. So yeah, because I mean, because because yeah, yeah. also you know, don't take this stuff literally. Like, don't take it too literally. This is just the cartoon interpretation of yeah. us, not actually us. Yeah. But to say like that's because like, like try trying to like nail like a like a skin tone color because I mean like you know because you 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 yeah like I said like as you brought up you're a little olivey uh, I'm I have like a natural tan as you know so I was like trying to convey that and yeah that's that's all that that's all where that came from I think even you ended up a little bit darker in that image as well uh, and then mm -hmm. for the last comment I have 
uh, I'm going to pronounce it probably the way this person says it. Uh, Saiyan Sleek Media uh, said, going back, to, uh, going back is nostalgic. Z is the best. Most fans do go back. I do. There are many ways to look at the show. It's deep. Okay, well, first off, I'm, I'm gonna agree. I'm gonna disagree that Z is the best uh, Dragon Ball. Uh, if anyone knows anything about me, knows that I think Dragon Ball is by far the best of the four shows. But uh, I'm gonna to disagree with this whole idea that this, like, oh, like you can go back and look at it so many ways. The show is so deep. I always kind of get annoyed when people try to like make Dragon Ball out to be this big, deeper, more complex thing that it actually is. Like, Dragon Ball is a really simple series. Yeah, you can sit there and mine depth out of it, but you can do that with any story. Like, I mean, you can look sit, you can look into the, you know, the, the complexities of the cat in a hat if you really wanted to. <laughs> you know, Dragon Ball is, on its surface, a, a, um, a very simple series. You know, it's not deep, it's not complex, it doesn't ask questions, it doesn't make you really think about complex issues or ideas. It's just, hey, here are these fun cast of characters, here's the adventures they, they, they go on, here's like these dudes that they fight. That is what Dragon Ball is pretty much at its core. Like, Toriyama was just trying to make a fun series. And like I said, like, yeah, you can go back and look at it many ways, but I mean, you can look at, you can do anything. You can do that with anything. I mean... You know, it, it's not like there is like there. Cause I feel like you know the the like the things that you could really mine out of Dragon Ball to talk about it on a on a more uh, academic level is like its history, like you know the influence it had on later shows, the influence it had uh, like just in Japan culturally, uh, the influences it, it pulls from, like previous works that existed that it pulled from. Journey to the West, or previous manga that existed. You know, those are the things I think that you can look deeply into. But as far as the characters and their narratives, for the most part, they're not that deep and complex. Gabby, do you have an opinion on this? I honestly, I, I say, okay, you know what? Like, as somebody who has definitely, at some points, probably overanalyzed this series, like, like just because, like, just because the author's intention is, like that it is a simple story. It doesn't mean that, like, it's invalid to make it, like, you know, to overanalyze and, like, to, like, look at things in sort of deeper ways. Because, like, after all, sometimes there are things where, like, you sometimes you do this and some, sometimes they sort of almost do this kind of subconsciously and there's sort of, like, proper reasons. And, like, you know, it's, like, even if it does seem simple, like, the reason as to why that would kind of appeal to him and why that would appeal to us in general, like, that's something that's also kind of worth looking into. I, I say, you know what, guys? I, I'm gonna disagree with Dion here. You know what? Overanalyze all the hell you want. I'm not going to. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not saying. I'm not saying not to overanalyze. Like, I mean, you can sit there and deconstruct the hell out of whatever you want. Like, I mean, even I've talked about you know elements of Dragon Ball. Cause I mean, I feel like you know you you can mine more wealth out of it. But to say that Dragon Ball itself is deep, I mean, you you can mine things out of it. But just to to, to objectively state that it is a deep show. I think is false, is my stance. But yeah. Uh, you know, because I mean, like, you know, like, like, I'm a guy who came from, you know, like, watching a whole bunch of My Little Pony analysis videos years ago, and I've seen people mine a lot of depth out of that show. And the thing is, though, like, some of it's intentional, some of it's probably just accidental. Yep. Um, and like I said, like, I mean, I think you can mine a lot of stuff out of Dragon Ball. But like I said, you can do that with anything. And that's why I don't think... I mean, it's not Evangelion. It's not even Mobile Suit Gundam. You know, it's... You know, Dragon Ball is just meant to be kind of a fun kid show. Can you get a lot more out of it? Of course. Like I said, you can get more out of anything. You know, you, you, you can really mine depth and complexity out of any story if you try. Uh, or even if just something personally resonates with you. And you can... You know, and you come to your own just natural conclusions without trying to look that deep into it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the show itself is deep, deep, or it's trying to say something deep, or it's even intended to be deep. It's just, you know, you got something personal out of it. Right. It's the whole. It's just the point I was trying to make. I don't think it is deep, but you can get something out. Of I think that. What do you think that is probably the difference between like overanalyzing this without, like, with basically without seeming obnoxious about it or not? Basically, like, 
as long as you appreciate that the series is never necessarily intended to be this deep and it's not necessarily like it's not trying to be a complex series from the very beginning and that some of this stuff that you're looking into might 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 have actually been unintentional then you can do that in fact you can do whatever you want and sometimes that's actually really fun just as long as you acknowledge that like if you start thinking that like you know this entire time that Toriyama was trying to make you know incredibly complex metaphors and this is a thing on this and you know this was planned out from the very beginning and this is much more complicated than you think it is and like that that's the point where I'm sort of like I, I actually don't think the author himself would agree with you so maybe you maybe you shouldn't yeah. make that conclusion so yeah uh, I think that wraps up this dragon cast um Oh, huh? just, just I, oh, just, just. Uh, oh. There was one comment I saw, but this one, but this one was directed to me. But it was just so, it was just so like lovely. I have to, I have mm. got to say it. So, anyway, this oh, time, I'm sorry, self shilling, but whatever. Anyway, saying, so yeah, this uh, is from Dylan Morgan seventeen. It says, Gabby, it's really good to, to hear your voice again. My lifestyle has changed, and back when I had no job before I started working, I watched your Dragon Ball Super reviews on the weekly. Since you and Zion have your podcast going, I can possibly check in on your thoughts and feelings about Dragon Ball in a way which suits my schedule. I have never really heard your thoughts on the early days of Dragon Ball either, and whenever there was a break in the schedule with Super, I was usually begging to hear you do a Dragon Ball retro review as opposed to your Dragon Ball Z retro review. This way I've gotten many of the things I wanted out of you long, uh, from long, long ago, so thank you. He's saying I'm an Aussie and I currently live in Japan, so it is nice to have the familiarity of an Aussie voice talk about a valuable piece of Japanese popular culture while I'm getting on with my day to day. I look forward to hearing more of you and Zeon in the future. Oh, that's a nice, that's, that's a nice, that's a nice comment. I like know, it. right? Oh, thank you. There are there, there are kind human beings in the Dragon Ball <laughs> fandom. Who would have guessed? If you if you, if you, go, if you go to Reddit or Twitter or Facebook groups, yeah, you, know, you might think that they're all malice, hateful monsters who want to just shove opinions down people's throats and yell at people about power levels and tell them how retarded they are for liking X or Y. But no, there there are genuinely good, kind, considerate polite human beings out there and it's always nice to be reminded of that yeah honestly although to, to actual response i think so, part yeah. of the reason as to why i just haven't really talked as much about in dragon ball sometimes i felt like i haven't really i don't really have as much to say about dragon ball although then again we've been making these are always been like an hour and a half so maybe i'm wrong although maybe that's just the on like or just us looking into getting trying to get lots of deep a lot of topics out of it i don't know but yeah talking about dragon ball like i just feel like i just I need to as well, because even see, sometimes I don't really know my opinions about it. See, Actually, I, I, I still don't really know my opinions about it. I'm just thinking, noticing things that catch my attention. See, I, I don't think that we try to get topics out of this. I think we just... Because, I mean, you and I have had ridiculously long conversations about just individual episodes of Super or Dragon Ball or just individual events within the franchise. So, I mean, this is, a no this is nothing new for us. It's just now we're recording it. Basically. So... I'd say there's some kind of pressure that we yeah. have to talk about things like actually in a smart way, but it's not really. It's just we're, mm -hmm. we're just we're just the same people we normally are. We just talk about things, and you guys actually care about what we have to say. Yep. Yeah, and hopefully you guys continue to keep caring and liking this stuff because we're 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 going the distance. Hopefully. Hopefully. Like I I I really don't want to end this thing prematurely like my previous attempts. Uh. You know, this is I have a co-host to bounce things off of, and it's and like the schedule for this, it should go pretty pretty cool. Hopefully, so yeah, yep. um, Gabby, any closing thoughts? No, not really. That's just yeah, but Dragon Ball fandom overanalyzing things, weird things, yeah. Toriyama intentions of things, um, all the all the words are swirling yeah. around in my head. I don't even know. Yeah, well, uh, we we I think I think this is our longest podcast yet. <laughs> Uh, we've... Of course it is, and it's about the episodes that we thought we weren't going to talk much about. Of course this happened. Well, that's it. I, it's only because of Goku with his ape form. Damn it. If he... Yeah, exactly. Damn it. This... We spent so much time on that. But, you know... It was like our Masuka Nozawa conversation all over again. Right. But whatever. I feel like that was way more relevant than the, oh my god, Nozawa was amazing conversation that we had. True. So, True that. Yeah. You'll um, never see that. Yeah. So, anyhow... Uh, uh, I guess that's it. Uh, we'll see you guys next week for uh, the end of the peel-off arc, the start of the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai. Until next time, guys, Zeon, out. Bye, guys.